So we are live. Hello to incredible children's author, Caitlin Kate Aronson. What a pleasure to have you on my children's podcast channel for the New Books Network. And uh, children's literature now has almost 60,000 downloads. And this is so exciting. And it's because I get to interview incredible and modest authors like you. So oh. welcome, welcome to the podcast, Kate. Thank you so much, Mel. I, it's a huge honor to be here and I've had the pleasure of watching a few of your interviews so far and I can't wait to catch up on the others, so thank you. Okay, don't forget to watch and share your own. Okay, I, I, I will. Okay. I, I will if it goes okay. We'll, we'll no, see. it's already okay. going, oh, it's already, the, the, the first 10 seconds are the difficult ones. <laughs> okay. That's good to know. All right. Okay, and, and where are we talking from? You are somewhere in uh, La Belle France. That's right. I'm actually on the Franco-Swiss border. I am. I live inside the Jura Jura National, or excuse me, Regional Park. So I am kind of on a on a mountain plateau here. Um, it's a rather cool region compared to Southern California, where I grew up. But it's a beautiful region, and uh, you know I go into to Switzerland to work each day, so it's uh, it's nice. It's nice to mm -hmm. be living between two countries. And and now I understand everything. The reason that you write about bulls and pigs is because <laughs> you live in a national park. Regional and, park, yeah. Regional. And, and 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 your and your job. No, no, I'm making this up now. And okay. your job and your job is look to look after all these animals. Oh, exactly right. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, I do. I do live in a two hundred year old farmhouse, so that that could have something to do with it. The the, the farm, uh, the animals. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we share several things in common. Uh, one of them is that we are um, North American people who don't live in North America. Yes, isn't that and, lovely? And uh, we both love uh, children's literature. Uh, you are incredibly successful. I am not, at least yet. Uh, and um, we also share a love for smells. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> as in your as in your piglet book. Um, so, so what would you like to talk about? Um, you know, the show concentrates on books that are coming out and books that came out during the COVID era that did not get the exposure that they deserved. Right. And you are one of the most prolific authors I've had on this show. Uh, you have five or six books that have come out very recently or are coming out. Right. Um, and you have a book coming out in 2025 with Candlewick. That's incredible. You have books with Penguin Random House, uh, Pay Street Kids. Um, you only go for the best. <laughs> So uh, these houses are were dream houses. Yes. So chapeau to you, and and at least three of them that I counted. Um, so um, where do you want to start? Do you want to concentrate on Clovis today, and then maybe later in the year we'll have you back and talk about the piglets. Um, let's let's talk about Clovis. Okay. I mean, I I could talk to you about smells and piglet, but let's start with Clovis because I think okay. that that is the most intriguing. Okay. So this one. Clovis keeps his cool. This one came out in uh, in August, so just this past August, and um, yeah, Clovis has been so well received. I I am I'm so honored and grateful. Um, the Wall Street Journal featured Clovis, and then um, School Library Journal named Clovis a best book of 2021. So that was just a dream come true. I didn't see that coming at all. Um, I have to give a shout out to the illustrator, Eve Farb, who did an amazing job. I mean, look at that cover. <laughs> okay, the, the people on the podcast are just going to have to go out and run and buy the book. And yeah, don't forget okay. to add the links to where you can buy the book and yeah. see these incredible illustrations. But the people who are following us on video, if you open the book, can see some of those delicious double spreads. Mm. that Eve has done. Would you like to open the book? Sure, sure. Okay, this is the prompt for you to open the book and show some. Yes, yes, I, thank you. I'm a bit, I'm <laughs> a bit slow on the uptake, but that's... 
<laughs> so you so you're hoping for a double spread but you know the double spread might give something away so i'm um, uh here actually all the double spreads give give no, the, 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 the podcast is about the story the book is out i understand yes you know people well, can take it home buy two copies and paste it on their walls in the living room <laughs> the book is out there Right, for, no, for the world. definitely out there. And uh, yes, so grab a copy and flip through it. But um, no, no, buy a copy. Buy a copy. <laughs> Please do buy a copy. Caitlin, just, just open a page and show the audience. I'm going to show here. I'm going to show um, just a few of the opening spreads because yes, why don't even, you do that? even this first double spread is lovely. Uh, we can see that Clovis works in the proverbial china shop and who, who is granny your granny you've dedicated this book to your granny yes and this book is about a a sort of a conversation with your granny is that really your granny no not in, no not entirely um i i dedicated this book to to my grandmother because she loved beautiful tea things you know she loved fine china and um and she just loved uh, collecting beautiful things. So um, that's why that's why there is a granny in this book. Um, so go ahead, also, uh, show, show the pictures because I'm going to out the story sure. in, in a minute. Sure. And there's nothing that's going to help. So there was just, do you want to read it a little bit, a bit of it? Sure, sure. I'll start out with it. Clovis ran his granny's old china shop in the town square. On inventory day, he unpacked and stacked porcelain so fine you could almost see through it. Never did he drop one dish. Grace, Grace, nothing broken to replace, he whispered, as Granny used to say. There was just one problem. Clovis had a temper as big as he was. As a linebacker for the Cloverdale Chargers, he'd lost his temper on and off the field. But since taking over Granny's shop, he felt calmer. Until the day a few old rival players dropped by. Okay. I will <laughs> stop there. <laughs> okay, so, so, um... I'm giving a talk in a couple of weeks about where ideas for stories come from. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they, they usually come from a, a, a twist and you have several hilarious twists in your story, but the main one is the famous adage, like a bull in a china shop. Exactly. So where did you get this idea, Caitlin? Right. Well, I think it, it was simply that. It was this, uh, this saying that we have that it, exists you know in other languages as well i mean french has a version of that saying that includes uh, an elephant i think um but the bull in the china shop i thought gosh that is such a great image and um why why would a bull be in a china shop in the first place what might the story behind this be and as i thought about it more and more uh, I just love that juxtaposition of the bull in the china shop. Um, and I started, you know, digging for the backstory. Um, sorry, the, my dog is barking <laughs> in the background. Um, you, you, you didn't tell him that you have a podcast today? Oh, I did. <laughs> Many times. Um, so I just, uh, yeah, I started thinking about, um, you know, what is, what is a bull known for? having a temper um, and you know what might he what might his struggles be in trying to control that temper um, maybe he has kind of tried to reform his life and use calming techniques and really you know channel his late grandmother in keeping calm so that he can run this china shop that she's left for him one of the hilarious things is your like he, he keeps uh, trying to calm his nerves with chamomile tea and uh, and yoga. I I love it. Um, Meditation, yeah, everything. Do Do you have Do you remember the moment? Uh, this eureka moment 
mm -hmm. you had the twist, where the twist came to you, where you said, right. hmm, a bull in a china shop. Hmm. I do. I mean, it was a while ago now, but I do remember that. Yeah, I remember writing it over summer of gosh, 2018, I think it was. Mm -hmm. and I yeah, I just remember thinking. Um, I remember being really drawn to this character because often, you know, I love writing character driven stories. I love. Um, I guess that's that's kind of my sweet spot when it comes to to making uh, you know worlds in in my head. Usually, a character just kind of appears to me, and um, there's something intriguing about that character. I want to get to know that character more, and I start asking myself questions about this character, and the, and the backstory comes through. So, I mean, the more I thought about it, I was I was drawn to the fact that here is this very gentle soul who also has this other side to himself that he's tried to, to reform. And, uh, and then just when he has his life calm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and everything in order, well, here come three rivals from his past that are going to stir that all up again. And I think we can all relate to that. <laughs> So um, I think that's what really drew me to, to this character. And I think there's something endearing about him because, you know, he has that flaw. We're all flawed. He's very lovable, but he has this, this past that he has to kind of reconcile. Um, and yeah, I think, I think he's got several dimensions to him. So I, I teach my students that life is all about recruiting your demons. So he's kind of, you know, I, I look at Clovis, by the way, what, one of the terrific things you've done in this book is you make us love this, this bull um, because he is so human. Um, <laughs> and uh, the empathy just flows from, from page number one. Um, you know, a, a, a bull who, um, whose aspiration is to, uh, is to run his uh, granny's uh, china shop. Um, and, but he's also a prisoner. He, he's a prisoner of his, of his demon which is the which is he's he's very bullish right. uh and he's he's trying to um tame and what i say recruit the demon uh and uh so i i, I we won't go too much into the story i just want to check something okay quelque chose avec toi oui bien sûr okay um he he played american football right but for me just like your piglet stories, the story is European. Please correct me. Oh, that's definitely. Um, definitely, it has a European feel to it. That is also in a large part thanks to the illustrator. Um, but I definitely like that old world feel in, in my stories. I've lived in Europe for 15 years now, which is why I have a very odd accent. Uh, I have to go back to California for a few weeks to get the uh, the Valley Girl accent back. This is this is amazing because when I go from <laughs> Israel to Canada, uh, I notice that they their accent has changed. Right. They don't speak the same English that they used to. Exactly. Or or maybe it's me. So no, no, yeah, no, it's... You, you have a French accent, but you're you're a um, California girl. Yeah. <laughs> That's so exactly one, right. So one of the things that um, I love to talk about or interview is uh, where it all began. What, what, why do you write picture books? How did you get to France? Let's start at the very beginning. Okay, and the very, very beginning. I would say the very beginning is uh, when I was just a little girl. I mean, this is something that I've always wanted to do. No, no, Kate, the beginning is I was born in San Diego Exactly. My father okay. was a bullfighter okay, from okay. Spain. I my was mother, born. <laughs> my mother had a porcelain store. Yeah, that's right. Um, yes, I. So I was born in uh, Orange County. Uh, <laughs> yes, and um, you know my parents. One second, one second. How how Orange County? Balboa Island, Orange County. Okay. Yes. Well, I grew up frequenting uh, Balboa Island, but I was born in. Fountain I knew it. Valley. You knew okay. it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, gosh, love, love Balboa. Yeah. Miss that a lot. 
so no, I was born in Fountain Valley, grew up in Costa Mesa, Huntington Beach area, and yeah, going to Balboa all the time, the beaches in general. Um, my my mom and dad were were really into reading and storytelling. Um, my mother was a huge children's literature fan, and that had a, a big effect on me. She she read aloud to me all through my childhood. At that time, um, you know, today TV is not the big deal that it that it once was. Now we're so computer oriented and on our phones and everything. But at the time, of course, in the eighties uh, when I was born, uh, TV was a big thing, and we actually didn't have a TV. <laughs> when I was born. And I think that gave me an interesting start in the sense that, um, you know, reading and storytelling was was a big deal in our family. Um, you know, growing up, that's what we did in the evenings. Uh, my mom read to me, my dad made up his own stories. And I have two younger sisters. So my dad would tell us stories at bedtime. And uh, I think that that fired my imagination and gave me um, yeah, the desire to make my own stories up one day. And I was, uh, I was really into art and drawing as a kid. I wanted to grow up to be a Disney illustrator. And at some point I got illust I got frustrated with my, my drawing and my art. And I kind of made this switch as a kid into the writing, into telling stories, uh, with my words. And so from about third grade, I would say, I knew that I wanted to make books. I knew that I wanted to tell stories and I never outgrew the picture book. I've always been fascinated by the dynamic of the picture book and how you have words and images, um, you know, that weave together and make something much greater than the sum of its parts and that that's actually something that I'm um, working on in my master's thesis right now, talking about all that with translating stories and, and all that. So um, I would say fast forward to... No, no, don't, don't, want, don't fast forward me, dear. We have a lot of time for this. this well, I'm most... only fast forwarding to age 18, I mean... No, no, that, no, I don't want you to fast forward that fast. You know? <laughs> From, from eight to 18 in two seconds. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> soudainement. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, if you've seen any of my uh, podcasts, I have a theory that I check with all my wonderful interviewees. Yes. Which is, um, are you stuck at the age of five? Like I am and so many other writers. <laughs> am I stuck at the age of five? Uh, no, but probably eight or nine. <laughs> Uh, in the sense that um, I still have a sense of wonder. I mean, if that means I'm stuck in childhood, then so be it. Um, Do you know why you are? Um, no. <laughs> Actually, yes. Okay, I do have I do have a theory. I just think that my my parents worked so hard at giving me um, a great childhood. Making, making memories with me when I was a child that I think I just had a ball as, as a kid. And I know that a lot of people write from write because they didn't have a good childhood. Um, they write to maybe to work things out or try to understand things better. Um, I think that's so honorable and I so admire those people. And I think I write for the opposite reason. I think I just loved my childhood so much. <laughs> Uh, no, I... uh, Kate, this is very common. Okay. No, I, I write because I had an idyllic childhood until the age of five, and then everything got screwed up. Oh, yeah. So what happened to you at the age of eight? I mean, this is this is this is fine, but something happened to you when you were eight years old, and that's why you said. And now we're going to fast forward from the age of eight. <laughs> to the age of eight. What happened when you were eight? No, I think, okay, if, if you put it that way, maybe it's more 10 or 11. I remember um, at the age of, of 10 or 11, it was like, I suddenly realized, I suddenly um, woke up to the fact that the world was, you know, dangerous. The world was not, not so nice as life uh, 
at home <laughs> was. And I remember at age 10 or 11, I really started to experience more anxiety. And it was, I think at that, I think that was maybe kind of the, the loss of innocence age where I started to notice the world around me and that bad things happen out in the world. Um, and I think that is kind of a classic yeah, age. Where... Pig, piglets get eaten for supper in the real world. <laughs> right. And in France, you know, I've just written a book about the, about a, a wonderful rabbit. Um, in France, nobody's going to buy that book if it's ever sold. Because they say, why should I, why should I like a rabbit when I eat them for supper? <laughs> yes, well, I don't know many French people who still eat rabbits, thankfully, but I'm sure there are a few. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I think it must have been around that age when, um, yeah, when I realized, okay, well, li life at home was, was nice and safe. And the big bad world is not, is not quite the same. So, so you're right. I suppose we do, um, you know, turn to writing children's books later on in life to sort of recapture the magic. <laughs> exact, exact them all. We're, we're pining mm -hmm. for something that doesn't, you know, on the one hand we say, okay, kids, you know, uh, we want to introduce you to the world, but we're not introducing them to the real world because right. That's a real world where the pigs get eaten and... Um... Right, it's a filtered world. However, um, you know, it's important that eventually, little by little, you know, we remove that filter. But I think that picture books are, are there to give them a first window to the world. And um, what I love is that I, I love the picture books that are for slightly older kids that introduce maybe some more complex topics. Um, Clovis is not the youngest on the youngest end of the, the picture book spectrum. And that's something that I, I really appreciated that the editor and the publisher allowed that. Um, okay. because I, I, I must tell you that the five-year-old in me had a good time reading it. Oh, good. <laughs> um, the, the adult in me said, okay, you know, you've done the Hollywood thing. Yeah. I was kind of expecting him uh, not to turn out so well in the end. You know, we talked about the Jewish tikkun before the show. Right. Um, he's really a tikkun. Uh, he's, he's like um, the, uh, the Christian that turns uh, the other cheek. <laughs> are, are you a religious Christian? I was raised in a very religious household. So I think. Well, there you um, go. Yeah, but I will say, I think it's really important. And I, I think I read something that you wrote as well along these lines that, um, you know, we're not here to preach in our books. If there's a message that comes through naturally, organically, great. But it has to be something that is, is really um, rooted in some kind of universal truth that is just, that flows naturally from the story. So I definitely didn't sit down to um, you know, preach at anyone. And um, if my books have messages, I definitely didn't sit down to put a message into them as I was writing. Um, I think it's best to sit down with a, with a question, some kind of curiosity, even if it's about curiosity um, about this character that popped into your head. You wanna know them better. You wanna know why they appeared to you. Um, I think that's so important not to set out to give some message, give some moral. Uh, I, I, I can tell you as a Jewish guy <laughs> that if what happened to, to Clovis happened to me, it would be 17 years before I would even talk to my friends. Um, <laughs> sure. So your, your Clovis is a very, very um, compassionate Well, you know, uh, we only have 32, 40 pages instead of... <laughs> 17 years so yeah oh yeah it, it, it's okay i love the story and i really think that every uh, every kid uh, should have the book um and uh, every parent should enjoy the the fun that i had reading it oh, thank and, you. and of course and of course with the wonderful illustrations yes. um so now we're now i'm going to let you be 18 okay and, and talk <laughs> about and talk about your career and especially how you became so successful. I mean, I know that you're modest and, and all that, but only one out of five or 10,000 writers for children get published traditionally. 
and you have a whole slew of books out. So what's the story, dear? Yes, it's, yeah, it, it is amazing when you put it that way. It, it, I mean, I do realize it. I'm grateful every day for the, for, for the luck that I've had. Share, share your story now. Okay, so age 18, I, I believe I was 18. I saw a movie you might know and remember that I think came out around that time. Um, You've Got Mail. <laughs> this, you know that this was the original name of the podcast i do know <laughs> Be, before i was bought out by the new books network i do know that so i had to make a reference to it because actually oh, thank they, you <laughs> it's an important reference because well i you know every, i think everyone at that time appreciated nora Ephron and her great wit and sense of humor in in films in general but I saw that movie at the time, You've Got Mail, and it dawned on me, I am Kathleen Kelly. I am the woman in this movie. This is what I want to do. I want to be a children's bookseller. Um, and at age 18, I mean, I was just out of high school, and there was an independent children's bookshop just opening up uh, in my neck of the woods, and it just, you know, it felt like destiny so <laughs> so right away I applied for the job got the job because I did you know I did know children's literature so it just fit really well um and that that was the beginning of about five or six years that I worked in children's bookshops so sadly that shop closed after 9-11 because you know there was quite a, an economic crisis following September 11th that was around that time um so worked a few years there um you know just hand selling books that I loved the most amazing job um and then I was hired at a second independent children's bookshop um also in in Costa Mesa actually so same same neck of the woods and um and then worked my way up to manager and then purchaser so to be able to be the one choosing the books that came into the shop i mean an incredible position so all of that influenced me so heavily and uh you know at the time i just i knew the market so well i'm pretty rusty now but at the time it was such a gift to be able to um, to introduce people to the books that I loved. So that's, um, that was a very formative experience. One second, and then, I, I forgot to ask you, as a five-year-old, what was your favorite children's book? Ah, well, I knew you'd ask that. I mean, I thought you might. You should have reminded so, me. <laughs> so this book, I absolutely love The Jolly Postman. So um, Janet and Alan Allberg, uh, British author and illustrator, uh, just a classic. I think, I think most kids, uh, they grew up in, I don't know, 80s, 90s, et cetera, uh, know and love this book. And there's, I don't know if I can show a second one. Of course Am I allowed you can. to have two favorites? Okay, it's your, it's your, it's your show, dear. <laughs> because one favorite is just not enough, so. Okay. A second one, uh, I adored Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Uh, of course, another that's another um, couple. You know, we had, gosh, we had so many amazing uh, author illustrator couples at that time. So Judy and Ron Barrett. So yeah, another magical one for me. Okay. Had you grown up in my era? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you would have loved uh, Madeline by Ludwig Bemelmans. Oh, well, I do. I have it, of course. And it's not one of your all-time favorites? Well, if you really... Uh, that's, that's okay. You know, in, in a house in Paris. I was like, I was so but sure. But it is. I own it. I mean, if you really want to know how many favorites I have, we'll, we'll uh, be here for the rest of the year. So I thought I would just... Choose no, but to. I would because you're a francophone. I was just sure. Exactly. You know? Oh, but I have it, and you know, I um, 
I do mention it obviously in this uh, master's thesis I'm doing, okay. which is all on translating picture books. So. We're going to we're going to get there. So actually, that's a good segue because <laughs> you 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 worked for five or six or seven years, and you and moved then, your way up from a um, a shop uh, seller to a purchaser right. of books. Right. Um, what about your college degree? Well, I was doing that uh, on the side because. Because I was working, um, I needed to find, I guess, a more unorthodox way of finishing school. <laughs> and at the time, um, you know, Vermont College, which which actually is um, Union Institute and University, but they offer a master's in children's literature, I believe, or writing for children. Mm -hmm. So at the time I was kind of aiming for that, but I started out with a BA through that school because I was able to do everything uh, by distance learning. So I had, you know, professors following me. Uh, I was able to do the work on the side. So you, and... you, in, you invented the offshore learning. <laughs> invented well i was one of the first i think one of the first students to be doing that so it's not for everyone but i always loved it because if you have you know if you're disciplined enough to do your work on your own you can sort of balance your professional career and your you, you sound you sound like a person with a with a a chocolate box i i haven't heard you know we've been on the air for 30 minutes and we'll be on more because we have more stuff to cover <laughs> and I'm going to invite you back to talk about the piglets. Uh, okay. I, I haven't heard any angst, any, um, you know, you're all blue skies. No, <laughs> no, but I mean, oh, no, I'm, no, I'm happy not... because post COVID, it's wonderful to interview somebody who's so up and positive and wonderful. Um, and then you ended up in France. How did you end up in France? Yes, well. That's, I don't know how I ended up in France, but let's put it this way. I, I've, I've traced it to a certain thing that happened. Um, in that second bookshop that I worked for, that I was manager and purchaser for, um, Random House at the time announced a, a contest, uh, a window display contest. And Random House invited independent bookshops to decorate uh, a window display. And the theme was travel because at the time, um, audiobooks were also becoming a big thing. And audiobooks on CD, of course, back in the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were, they did this contest trying to promote their audiobook library. And of course, wow, travel, I just, you know, that fired my imagination. I, I designed a window display. I have no photographic evidence of that, which, <laughs> okay. which is really sad. <laughs> um, I think I'll be going through my parents' storage unit this summer trying to find evidence of that, just because, just for the memory. But anyways, I ended up winning that window display contest really didn't see that coming. I mean, it was a dream. I remember staying late after work, working on my window display. I had a giant postcard. I had an airplane swooping in. I, you know, I had all this stuff. So uh, one day Random House calls me and says, you won the grand prize, a trip to Paris, dinner on the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and I just, you know, hung up the phone and started screaming and couldn't believe my luck. So then, uh, yeah, then I, I won this trip to Paris, a few days in Paris, and that must have kind of sealed my fate because a few, a few years later, I moved to France permanently. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, maybe, maybe that's somehow related. Um, I did have friends in France, so that was another reason. I had also taken some uh, French in high school and all of these threads kind of wove together and I found myself in France. Okay, but you're far away from Paris. And now your, I am. Yeah. And your family. 
Yes, yes. I don't recommend that part. <laughs> right. It, it is hard. Well, Kate, there's one incongruity before we go sure. any further. Yes. You mentioned the anxiety, and I was all I was getting all excited because I suffered from agoraphobia for years. Ah, I yes. Said, oh, here's yeah. another tr person with anxiety, and then you just like, oh, having dinner on the Eiffel Tower. You know, I'm I'm gonna. <laughs> no, but I'm gonna have to take say. I'm gonna have to take pills tonight just hearing you say that. <laughs> no, but let me say once I you know, took the plunge and moved to Europe. That's when I was out in the big bad world. And it seemed like after that, everything went wrong. Uh, <laughs> so, so yes, things seem idyllic in my life up until that point. And I think um, I needed to get out into the big bad world, leave my family behind, leave my country behind and really fly solo and when I did that um it was a real eye-opener and very difficult because giving everything up to move to Europe starting from zero not being able to speak the language because I don't care how many lessons you've had in high school high school French when you get to France <laughs> you might understand but you can't say a thing so it was a huge huge struggle and really debilitating because for years I couldn't communicate as an adult and I had to start everything from zero, finding a job, uh, finding friends, finding a place to live, trying to survive. I mean, no, there's, it's not all blue skies, not at all. <laughs> but your, your writing career is blue skies. As we said. It looks but, like that. No, but you are one in a million. How did, how did this happen? Yes, well, um, that dream that I had always had was still there in the back of my mind. Um, but I did go through a lot of hardship, actually, in Europe. And I, it wasn't until 2015. So I moved to Europe in 2007. It wasn't until 2015 that I had sort of conquered and I had made a little life for myself and I felt at peace enough to reach back to that dream and say okay now I have stories to tell but it's because I had been through the pain been through um been through a lot that I think I finally had um some stories to tell and so in 2015 I decided and it was very sudden I just felt ready to put my head down, nose to the grindstone, start writing like crazy, start uh, querying like crazy. I started um, querying the few independent publishers that had an open door policy, meaning you could sub submit manuscripts to them without an agent. Uh, I tried that, I think at the time that must have been six or seven. I didn't know what I was doing. I tried that first. Either I didn't hear back or, you know, th these, these were rejections. So I decided, okay, I'm going to turn my sights to getting an agent. So I kept on writing, kept on submitting, um, joined the wonderful uh, 12 by 12 challenge that Julie Hadlin had put together. Had always kind of been an SCBWI member over the years you know, without being quite serious enough, but always dabbling in the SUBWI. So finally, I just got serious. And I think, I think, Mel, that I had well over 100 rejections by the time I, yeah. But I mean, I encourage that. I encourage people to, to aim for 100 rejections as soon as possible, just like in chess, you know, lose 100 games as quickly as you can, that's the quickest way to develop your skills. <laughs> so, or, or, or to lose thing. more games. <laughs> right. And so that's what I did. And considering that I started getting serious in 2015 and had several agent offers by 2016, just shows you um, 
How much it, I mean, I, I was really probably submitting querying six to seven a week, six to seven times a week. So I was just a machine suddenly for one year. I was just doing that. Um, in 2016, I had several agent offers and I signed with my agent. Okay. And your agent is? Krista Heschke with Macintosh and Otis in New York. A uh, wonderful agency. And so, yeah, she's no, but my I mean, agent. But you, you know that agents like Krista go through thousands of manuscripts a year. Yes, yes. And, and take, on, take on two or three new authors. Exactly. And, and I, so you, you were discovered through the slush pile. That's right. I was discovered through the slush pile. Um, you know, I, she, she's, I not your, she's not your cousin. You didn't no. have lunch with her. <laughs> no, I mean, no, you realize no. this is this is really incredible. I, I, oh, you know, of course I, I realized please, it. Please send me. OK, I will not share it. Please send me your query letter. <laughs> there, ha there has to be incredible magic in this query letter. <laughs> I promise not to share it. Okay, yeah, I don't, I don't think there was incredible magic, but okay. I, um, no, I understand. I, I don't mean to make it sound easy. It wasn't easy. And I think um, you have these moments in, in your career where things can suddenly go very quickly, but then things can suddenly slow down again. For example, I signed in 2016. Um, and then I don't think I sold until a few years later. So it was very hard, you know, it's when you're starting out and you have no name whatsoever, it's really hard even for your agent to go knocking on editor, editor's doors saying, I have this new author, you know, do you, are you interested in any of these things? It, it takes time. So suddenly things went really quickly, then slowed down again. And then in 2019, um, we sold piglets. Oh no! And then quickly, uh, Where, five minutes. have you gone? That. Come back, Caitlin. Please come back. We will wait a minute for Caitlin to come back. I'm still here. I think it just froze. Okay, so uh, so after waiting for three years. Yes, so we sold uh, Piglet in 2019, mm -hmm. and suddenly everything sped up again. And in a matter of two years, I think it was about two years, we sold six manuscripts. So, ah, you've frozen, Mel. Okay. Are you there? It keeps freezing. I'm there. Listen, we're going to have to uh, um, uh, finish soon. Okay. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll continue. We'll have another one in a few months. Okay. And we'll talk about the piglets. Wonderful. Um, and maybe a few other things. And um, maybe someday you'll interview me as you um, generously, you. generously offered. Uh, this has been remarkable. I just, I, I need to say a couple of things. First of all, um, I have to uh, come clean and tell my audience that I, I, I talked about eating pigs, uh, but I, I'm Jewish and I keep kosher, so that it wasn't me. I, I just heard about other people eating pigs. It wasn't me. Um, and the other thing is that I really think that um, part of your charm as a writer is because of this language duality, this culture duality. And uh, there are other uh, famous authors who played between French and English or German and or English. And I think that this has a, a, a really a great contribution to your writing. Um, and you are yeah. now, you're now doing your master's in translation and you're using your own books to get your master's degree. Th well, that's a, that's a real, that's a real double whammy case. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, I finished, I finished all the coursework. It's um, the thesis that I'm writing now. Yeah, it does talk about this kind of duality being between two languages. And so I'm looking at the translating of picture books and 
Yes, so I do focus on the piglet books and translating them into French. And it's a lot of fun because they're full of alliteration, which is not easy to translate. So, but yes, I did, I did kind of bring in a, a personal touch to this project using my books. And you have to, because I, I also translate books. And um, it, if they're children's books, if they're picture books, if they're rhyming books, uh, you're not going to get it right. You're not going to be able to translate exactly what's there. Uh, exactly. You have to you have to create a version that has the uh, the esprit de corps that has the spirit of the um, original work. Exactly right. And uh, when you're translating your own stuff, then at least the author is not going to get particularly uh, fâché avec toi. Um, That's exactly what I. That was my thought when I chose that I thought well no one else can get angry with me now <laughs> exactly or the other thing is to translate dead people and then you know you don't have to worry about it but you can't ask that's them right. they won't tell you your, their opinion on your translations that's right and you can't know exactly what they meant either but hey right so so um I have to I have to close um okay. and uh I'll just say thank you to Caitlin Aronson Kate for this marvelous conversation. And we'll reschedule another one in a few months to talk about the Piglet series. You have two of them, so I have to guess there's gonna be more. And uh, maybe Clovis has another one coming out that you haven't told me about. I wonder what kind of job he's gonna get. Um, I hope it's not an airline pilot. <laughs> or, or perhaps it is, uh, oy vey. Only time will tell yes we shall see but thank you so much mel for having me and i would love to interview you mm -hmm. okay we'll make that happen so this is mel rosenberg for the uh, children's literature channel of the new books network uh and we've been here with the wonderful kate aronson to talk about her new book clovis I, i'm going to get it right clovis keeps his cool that's right so well, we kept our cool and uh, it's been wonderful. <laughs> we'll talk later. Thanks so much. Thank you. Merci okay. beaucoup. Merci à rien de toi. Uh, make sure that you share, add links, um, and uh, your books are truly uh, inspirational. Thank wonderful. you. Wonderful. I will do. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye.